So today I want to talk about out with the old. Out with the old. Get rid of it. it served its purpose. Now move to the new that the old is preparing us for. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. We can read in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, that the law, that's the old covenant, right? The law, having a shadow of the good things to come, a shadow, but not the very image of the things, it can never with these same sacrifices, which they offered continually year by year, make those who approach perfect or mature. Man's had the idea that he can straighten things out for himself. And you know, even those things that we have caused ourselves. So often we need the help from on high, don't we? And if we're, if we're not willing to seek help from on high, then we don't get it. Now we move up to the new covenant in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. Finishing with the last one I just mentioned, the sacrifices that they made continually year by year, they cannot make those who approach, it, who approach it perfect. They can't just mature you. So, let no one judge you in food or drink. That's Levitical ordinances, you understand? Let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. They were the shadow, but substance is in Christ, which means that Christ is the fulfillment of the entire Levitical law, the fulfillment of it all. Now, perhaps you've noticed that for the past few Sundays, the subject of my sermons has centered on Christian sacrifice and submission to the will of God, right? You heard that this morning from Ron, too. This is number one. My purpose in doing this is to move us from human opinion to divine truth, to find out what God actually says and how it's been changed by how we interpret what he says. <clears throat> it's in the nature of man to equate truth with that which is familiar or appealing to them. Isn't that the truth? People will accept things as true if it's familiar to them and if they're in agreement with it. But if it's not in agreement, or is unfamiliar, they want nothing to do with it. <clears throat> We're suffering that in a big way politically right now and socially. And this is one of the reasons that there's so much division. Because without truth, there is going to be division. Because without truth, we have opinions. And if there are as many opinions as there are people. And then you have groups, group thinking, Groups of opinions. <clears throat> Jesus knew that. <clears throat> that truth was a matter of what was familiar or appealing. He knew it. And he used parables to reveal to them what the truth really is. And how they've misinterpreted it with their traditions. Traditions. In Ezekiel 2, Ezekiel 12, chapter 12, verse 2, God said, Son of man, 
he dwelled in the midst of a rebellious house, which has eyes to see, but does not see, and ears to hear, but does not hear, for they are a rebellious house. Again, they want to hear those things that are familiar and those things that appeal to them. <clears throat> they don't need to change. Nobody likes change, right? After Jesus gave the parable of the sower in Mark 4, verse 9, he challenged them when he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He who has ears, look, we all have ears, right? Not everybody's deaf. But hearing is just not, uh, not just a matter of sound waves striking the eardrum and being interpreted by the brain. Hearing is receiving what you hear. And that's what Jesus is saying. He said, listen, you all have ears, you all have the ability to receive, but you choose not to. You choose not to. So, <clears throat> how are they going to learn? And who is it who has ears to hear? Is it not the one who is willing to see past traditional or familiar views and receive correction from the author of all truth? That's the one who hears. It, you know, it's by hearing the word. That's what it's all about. The only way that we get truth is through hearing the word. And then we understand the difference between truth and fiction and truth and lies. <clears throat> Tradition is so often a human interpretation of what God has given us as the truth. Jesus pretty much said this when he told the Pharisees in Mark 7 verse 9, all too well you reject the commandments of God. Why? So that you may keep your traditions. Your traditions. You know why? The traditions were familiar to them. But also, traditions gave them power. Power. And it wasn't just the authorities that had power. It was those who practiced their traditions had power. Because the power was in their performance not in the one who gave it. <clears throat> the natural man wants to be the author of his own salvation. Eh, not just his salvation. He wants to be the author of truth too. Because that would give him the right to set the rules. Man is more interested in the letter of the law than in the spirit of the law. What's the letter of the law? The letter of the law is what the law says, okay, on the surface. The spirit of the law is the purpose behind that law. There are people right now who are obeying the law, but they're violating the spirit. And there are people who are violating the law, but they're obeying the Spirit. And you know what? You can't tell the difference if you don't know the truth in Christ. <clears throat> Man is more interested in the letter than the Spirit. This is righteousness by human design. Righteousness by human design. And it's called Rightfully so, energy of the flesh. Right? If we're more interested in the letter than the spirit, care less about the spirit, just use the letter, then what we have is a righteousness by human design. But it is God who sets a standard for righteousness, and he has set it in Christ Jesus. Romans 10 verse 4 declares that it is Christ who fulfills the law. Jesus fulfilled the entire law. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The law is ended if you are a believer in Christ. 
Out with the old, in with the new. The law is based on God's holy will, and it is submission to God's holy will that is the spirit of the law. So regardless of what you read in words as a letter of the law, it's obeying God's will, which is the spirit of the law. The scriptures hold many examples of human tradition distorting the will of God, but the one I want to deal with in this message is the true meaning of the Sabbath and its relationship to the tradition of fasting. For centuries, the Sabbath was known simply as a day of rest and was religiously observed as such with penalties for violating it. It was considered as a day without human work and it was confined to Saturday. And it still is. Even to the extent that when Camille and I were in Israel, you get in an elevator and on a Saturday from from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, you could not press a button on that elevator. It stopped at every floor. I don't think, I don't think the buttons worked. You had to stop at every floor because pressing a button on an elevator was a denial of the Sabbath. Now, that's, that's fine. It says, you know, consider a day without human work. All right? Uh, simply as a day of rest and was re religiously observed as such. A day of rest. Okay. What are we talking about when we say rest? And when, where did we get the idea? Why do we still have the idea 2,000 years after Jesus that it's just a matter of relaxation? It is not a matter of relaxation. It's not a matter of ceasing activity. It is not that at all. When we talk about the rest, it's resting in the Lord. How do you rest in the Lord? You rest in the Lord by listening to him and living according to what he says. That's what resting in the Lord is. But to this day, and I'm telling you there are people in the church, I know people in the church, who have this crazy idea, well, you got to have a day of rest. Yeah. Sabbath rest. It's important. After all, God says you don't have to work seven days a week. You can take one day off. Well, fine, but that's not what Sabbath is talking about. And it wasn't talking about that with the Hebrews either, with the Jewish people. It was never talking about that. All he did was he said, look, until I come, until Jesus comes, right, I want you to take a special day. And, you know, I could talk for a long time on Saturday. And I'll tell you what, here's something really interesting, folks. Really, really interesting. And I'm not talking about Sabbath as God means it, but as Sabbath as man means it. Something that's really interesting is Monday, moon day named after the moon. Tuesday, Tuesday, named after uh, a, a, a Norse god. Wednesday, Woden's Day, another Norse god. Thursday, Thor's Day, another Norse god. Friday, Frigg Day, the wife of one of them, I can't remember which. Uh, that was Friday. Saturday, guess what? Saturn. Saturn. The named after Saturn. Do you know what Saturn is? It's the planet of limitation. The planet of limitation. You could so easily say Satan's day. So easily say that. The planet of limitation. And then Sunday, of course, Sunday. Well, you could change that so easily to S-O-N, couldn't you? But, but we don't do that. Because the point is that it's not in the day. It's in what the day represents. It was a label. It was just a fixed area that God gave them to, to keep them in a particular order, along with all the other Levitical orders, orders and everything. And all those Levitical laws, they had a purpose in keeping the culture together, the society together. 
For what purpose? Until he comes. And then after that, they're entitled to their, their, to their, uh, their society, their culture. They're entitled to all that. But all this other stuff, they need to listen to the one who created them. The one who created them said, out with the old. Right? You can still have your culture. You can still have all of that. But start to understand what I really meant by these things in the law. They all have a fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of them. And Sabbath is no different. In fact, Sabbath's right there, right up there at the top. Because Sabbath means what, Paul, what uh, Ron said this morning. Jesus said it in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, not my will, but yours be done. That is Sabbath rest. And it's not for a day it's not for a week. It's not for a year. It's for every moment of your life. And the only way that you can enter the rest of God is by being in agreement with him. And the only way that you can demonstrate agreement with him is by knowing what he says and doing what he says. As I've said on several times now in the last few weeks, what is it that you will not give up for him. Hmm? We'd like to talk about what we'll give up for him. Oh, I'll give up a bunch of meals for him. <laughs> so Sabbath, not just a day set apart for rest. It is the spiritual principle of surrendering the human will to the will of God. That's what Sabbath rest is. Rest in Him, not in my ability. Rest in Him, not what my culture or my government or my church says. Rest in Him. Look to Him for your source. Look to him for your guidance. Look to him for the path for you to walk. But Sabbath, not just a day of rest. So is the tradition of ceremonial fasting. The two go together and I'll show you in the scriptures just how they go together. People don't want to hear this. There, there are so many people, particularly, I you know, remember in New Age, too. Oh, we fast, and it, it uh, accomplishes great things. We fast. It works, it works, it works. I like to hear that. Fasting works. Well, uh, it's not about working. It's about emulating God. That's what it's about. It's about emulation. You know what emulation is, right? Copying, right? It means to become one with, right? It's unity, unity. You know, we talk about communion without realizing that true communion is in being at one with God. Not by practicing a tradition or a ceremony of any sort, but by being one with God. To let the I am of God be in touch with I am in me. Right? I'm talking about let the heart of God and the heart of me be in concert with each other. Does that make sense? Huh? I am is what? Consciousness. It's consciousness. And consciousness all comes from God. All consciousness. And we can either share in that conscious consciousness or separate ourselves from it. So ceremony of fasting and, and Sabbath keeping are very, very closely connected. This included Jesus. Uh, there, there was people that was against the whole thing. And if they were against it, they were accountable to the keepers of law. You know? 
uh, what was it? Something like you can't even rescue an, an animal on a Sabbath day, right? You, there's so much that you can't do. You, you, the, and, you know, when we were in Israel, uh, we, uh, in, in the buffet, in, in, in the breakfast buffet, you had a separation of uh, beef, uh, meat, and uh, dairy. Uh, you could not combine the two. Because if you did, that was a violation. Uh, and so that was enforced. Um, I don't know that when we were there that anybody actually got uh, penalized over that, but I know it was enforced. Like we're told you don't do that. There's a reason for that, and I'm not going to go into it. Well, yeah, I am going to go into it. Okay, just quickly, like, uh, you've got to look at why, the why is the why is for all this stuff. Uh, so... Um, there was a time in pagan culture when they would take a newborn calf and boil it in its mother's milk and then take that milk and spread it over the fields because they figured that that, that would add so much, so much to the crops. So yeah, they had a reason for that. You know, they, it's a pagan practice, okay. But, but then it's all lost. You don't need that anymore. You don't need that anymore. But they continue with it. Um, so there was a penalty if you violated the, key, the, 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 the law. They, um, this included Jesus who was asked by the disciples of John in Matthew 9 for, verse 14. Why do we and the Pharisees fast often but your disciples do not fast? You know, I love this. This is so, it's so obvious and yet it's so, I don't know, just ignored, I guess. But here it is. Jesus is asked, how come you and your disciples don't fast, but, you know, we fast, the Pharisees fast often. How come you guys don't? Well, the Greek word for fast here is nestio, 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 and it means to not eat, and that's a tradi traditional view of fasting. Not eat, right? In Matthew 9.15, the very next nurse, next nurse verse, I mean, Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bride bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Well, the, the, the word here is mourn. He says, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn while he's with them? Well, the Greek word for mourn is pentheo. And you know what? It means to grieve. It means to grieve. So they say, why do you not stop eating ceremonially as the... Uh, the um, uh, the, we do, uh, the, 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 the John does, you know. But you got, you don't. And Jesus says, well, you know, the day will come when I won't be with them and they will mourn. And you know what accompanies mourning? No appetite. No appetite. That's the difference. Here Jesus is saying that his disciples have no reason to grieve while he is with them, but when he is gone, then they will not eat because of their grief. They will not be hungry. So it will be for lack of appetite, not religious ceremony, that they will not eat. Then in Matthew 9, verses 16 to 17, it finishes it. Jesus explains how the time will come to put aside the, tradi the traditional understanding of the fast and recognize it as the, sense, uh, the principle of submission that God intended for maturing believers. He said this, No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. For the patch pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. Nor do they put new wine in old wineskins, or else the wineskin will break, 
the, the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. Ceremonial fasting had little or nothing to do with spiritual growth. In fact, it gave Satan the opportunity to promote pride in those who practice it. How come you don't fast? We fast. It, it works. It works. It works. I love that. It works. I don't care whether it works or not. It's not what God's talking about. So this, this I got from uh, rabbinic, rabbinic, the rabbinical commentary known as the Talmud. A Jew named Zadok did for 40 years so mortal, mortify himself with fastings that he was commonly called Kalsia, the weak. He did this so that a prophecy of destruction would not claim his city. But when the city was destroyed, see that, it did not work that time, right? When the city was destroyed and he saw it was in vain to fast any longer, he used the physicians of Titus to restore his health, which through much, too much abstinence had been wasted. He never got his health back, apparently. There seems to be a great deal of mysterious and hidden knowledge surrounding the ancient practice of fasting. And it is ancient. It was around before the Jews. But a sincere and honest study of this subject reveals a simplicity and sensibleness that the serious student of theology comes to expect of God. I have met people, Christian people, who ought to know better, who are so stuck on this idea of depriving themselves of food in order to get something from God, or whatever reason they might give. Ceremonial fasting. I've met so many of them. I wonder, why in the world do you not kind of dig in and look at why is it that God would say for you to do this? Why would he tell you to do this? There's a reason behind going without food. But they don't know what that reason is. And it's, but it's said, it's told, and I'm going to tell you what it is. And they're not doing it for the reason God says to do it. They're doing it you know, to bargain with God. And you can't do that. The Jews did it for a long time. It doesn't, it doesn't do what God wants us to do. First of all, it is to be noticed that ceremonial fasting is not a uniquely Christian practice. The pagan world was doing it long before there was an Israel. From perhaps the beginning of human history, people who believe in the existence of supernatural agencies or forces which may have the power to bestow capriciously, that is, on a whim, they can bestow good fortune or bad fortune on you. They've been finding ways to bargain with these agencies in the hope of gaining their favor. You, hear, you all hear me, what I'm saying? The primary, the primary technique seems to be abstinence of food. Abstinence of food. It is well known to psychologists as well as to practitioners of food deprivation that fasting in the, this form, ceremonially, can cause an alteration of consciousness. Well, that's fine if you're a hippie. In this way, pagans of old and modern New Age pagans both seek to gain access to the higher and spiritual realms of the gods. I know that Christian fasters will never say that. But you know what? It's either that or bargaining with God. I, where, where, what else is there? What else is there? There is something else. But they've got to see it in the scriptures before they understand it. The scriptures make it clear that we should keep a sound mind. Ephesians 5 verses 17, 18 says, Therefore do not be unwise, but understand 
what the will of the Lord is. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Why is it he says these things? Why is it that he gives us these things to do? And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation. But hold on to your mind. He wants you to have a sound mind. But be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. If you're going to have your consciousness altered, have it altered by God, not by food deprivation and not by drugs. Right? To the Jew, food deprivation was the highest form of safe sacrifice that one could make on one's own behalf. And even today, the Jewish people have used fasting as their means of atoning for their sins on Yom Kippur. Think about it. The Jews use it for atoning from their sins. Yom, Yom Kippur. Christian fasters should stop and wait a minute. Maybe he's got a point here. Because there it is. They do it in order for atonement. But wait a minute. True atonement is only by the cross of Christ. You starve yourself all, the, all day long, every day, for a week. Forty days. Forty days and forty nights. Starve yourself. It's going to, not going to atone you, folks. Not going to atone you. It's Christ alone. And you know what atonement means? It's interesting that you can break that down into at one month. At one month. What's that mean? It means becoming one with God. And the only way that's going to happen is by accepting the crucifixion of Christ in my place. Right? Nothing else will do it. In the Bible, fasting appears to quite suddenly to appear. As a matter of fact, in Judges 20, verse 26, and it was without any clue as to its origin. I'll tell you where I think it originated. I think it originated in the Garden in Eden. And I, I figured it originated with Cain. Cain figured, I'll do this because it will impress God. You know? And after all, I'm giving, I'm giving up eating for him. For him. Look what I'm doing for you, God. All references to fasting in the Old Testament used the word T-S-U-W-M, which I believe is actually pronounced Tsum. Tsum or one of its derivatives, but it always comes down to the same thing. This Hebrew word means to cover the mouth. Here's where it gets very interesting. To cover the mouth, which is a good indication that it concerns not eating, right? So, sum actually means this, to cover the mouth. But here's what's really interesting. In Job 29 verse 9, there is a Hebrew idiom. The princes refrained from talking and put their hand on their mouth. This is a Hebrew idiom that means gave worship. So, giving worship, but is giving worship by abstaining from food? Or is giving worship by abstaining from human will in favor of divine will. There's a question for you. But mostly fasting became a very early form of bargaining with God. I'll do this for you if you'll do that for me. This is not to say that all fasting was motivated by selfishness. But even the fasting that was practiced in order to purify oneself before coming into the presence of God, there's one, and still is based on a false premise and makes little sense and when reason is demanded of it. Unfortunately, man continues to emphasize the ritual with little or no regard for its real meaning or purpose. The only way, the only thing you have to do 
in order to prepare yourself to come into the presence of a holy God is become aware of his word and to apply it. Take time, what is it? Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, right? Where's, where's the starvation? Where's, where's going without food? Enter his courts with thanksgiving. I mean, his, his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Then you're in his presence and you're in worship, right? Man continues to emphasize the ritual with little or no regard for its true meaning or purpose. Just another form of works theology. Works theology. There are about 51 references made to fasting in the Bible. This does not include the books of the Apocrypha. And in all but a few of the cases in the New Testament, they are concerning food deprivation. It's all over the Bible. Food deprivation, food deprivation. Even in the New Testament. But you know, I'll tell you, you go back to what Jesus said when they said to him, hey, Jesus, you don't fast. Come on, fasting is a real big deal. You don't fast, why don't you fast? He says, well, because you don't know what fasting is. Your idea of fasting belongs to the old. Get rid of it. My idea of fasting is that we've got a new covenant, folks. And that new covenant has nothing to do with self-deprivation of food. There's only one place where we find clear and definitive discussion of exactly just what fasting is and what its purpose is. And where is that? You've heard me say it before. Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58. That entire chapter. And I'll tell you, Christians are without excuse if they continue to keep food out of their mouths ceremonially when they could read this chapter. And, but you know what? I'm, I am convinced. There are so many people so focused on their rituals and their ceremonies and, and their, their little techniques that they will read it and they still won't understand it. And there's no excuse for that. In this chapter, the Jews complain that God has not honored his promise, his promise to answer their petitions, right? Isn't that what he says? Go, go to verse 1, Camille. In fact, we'll move down through, through here. Isaiah 58. Okay. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate. Now, go, go back up. I know that that's where I've got you starting, but go, go back, go back to, to, to verse 1. Well, let, leave it there. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls, and you take no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your labors. What are you finding pleasure for? Oh, because we're obedient. We're doing what God said we are supposed to do. We are supposed to deprive ourselves of food. And so, you know, now we're happy about it. You know what that does? That, that produces pride. It's exactly what it does, right? Go to the next verse, 4. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. He's saying, look, all you're doing is setting yourself apart from all oh, those who don't agree with you, right? You're in judgment of them. And again, pride. But you know what? You're not going to fast this day the way you want to. I'll tell you what fast really is. Go next to one. Is this a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast, an acceptable day of the Lord? Yeah, they will. But it doesn't work, does it? Oh, wait a minute. 
supposed to work. Uh, next one. Is this not the fast that I have chosen? Here, I'll tell you what the fast is. This is not going without food. Fast is to loose the bonds of wickedness. You know, do things my way, right? To undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, that you break every yoke, that you care for each other because I care for you. Right? Next. Next one. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out when you see the naked that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh? What's he saying? He's saying denial of self is not about going without food. The only way going without food satisfies denial of self is if it's done in order that somebody who's hungry has food instead of you. You understand? Can you all see this? This is a big difference. Oh, look at what I'm doing. I'm making myself hungry. No. God says the only way that making yourself hungry has any, any validation is if it's for the sake of somebody else. Right? The naked... Oh, I'm giving all my clothes away. Well, all he's saying is that if, if you love your neighbor enough so that when a true need comes to you, you provide that need, right? That's really what it's talking about. You know, I, I preached on the difference between deeds and needs. You know, Christians love to do deeds, right? Because it's like, uh, it's like currency, heavenly currency, right? Do great deeds. But you know what? You can do a deed anytime you want to, but a need, that can be most inconvenient. A need that comes to you from somebody else. You provide that need, what you've done, you fasted. You fasted because it cost you something, right? It cost you something so that somebody else will have. Do you see all the way through here, we're talking about Jesus. When you do the least of these for these my people, you've done it for me. It's Isaiah 58. Boy. Verse, I'm going to go back to five here. It says it's a mistake to think that God can be bargained with. To think that all man has to do is to make himself miserable and humble himself to show, as a show of righteousness. And God will favor him with the desires of his heart as a kind of divine wages. The Catholic Church promoted the same idea with penance. Same idea, right? And one of the things that... Uh, that um, oh... They used to beat themselves. I can't remember what that was called. Flagellation, yeah, right. They, they would beat themselves, you know. This was the way of, another form of fasting, folks. Just another form of fasting. Penance. Well, penance is a Catholic idea, not God's idea. Equally wrong, far less reprehensible, is the idea that we can purify ourselves by communing with God by starving ourselves. One may take this practice on faith, but it takes little or no sense, makes little or no sense when exposed to New Testament doctrines of forgiveness and repentance, as illustrated in Isaiah 6 and throughout the, Old, the New Testament. Confession is the correct preparation to come into the presence of a holy God. So if true fasting is not a matter of food deprivation with the right motives, what is it? In Isaiah 56, 58 verse 6, Isaiah declares that God defines fasting as separating oneself from wickedness, fleeing oneself and others from unreasonable demands, and releasing those who have been oppressed or burdened by us. Then he says in verses 7 and 8, that when we feed the hungry or shelter the poor, we clothe the naked, even at our own expense or loss. 
that we ourselves may go into, that we ourselves may go without in order to do so. Then we reflect God's own spirit of compassion and we will be righteous in God's eyes. When we respond to the needs of others, then God will respond to our needs. Isaiah 58, 9 tells us that we must cease doing those things which burden us, bad habits or wrong thinking that, without, that with, withhold us from righteousness and to cease from hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is a big one. Hypocrisy. You know, it's hypocrisis, the compound Greek word, hypocrisis, which hypo means to be under. Uh, and crisis means judgment. To, to place yourself under judgment is to be hypocritical. Now, I know that that's not what you hear from most people. What you hear from most people is that it's a term that was used in the theater when somebody put on a mask and presented themselves as something they were really not. But that, that, that doesn't carry the weight that the Greek does. The hypocrite is placing himself under judgment and he doesn't even know it. In verse 8. If we do all these things, sorry, verse 10 to 11. When we do all these things, it tells us our understanding will blaze forth and the Lord will be our constant guide and protector. God will be well pleased with us and we will prosper as God considers prosperity. If you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light will shine, will sh shall dawn in... What happened to it? Then, oh, then your light shall break forth like the morning, your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Okay, darkness as noonday. Yeah. God will be well pleased. Implying a common purpose to some traditions is interesting to note that the end of Isaiah 58 leads right into a discussion of the Sabbath and its true meaning. Now we get to Sabbath. Here it is in the same chapter that it's all about fasting. Isn't that interesting, huh? Again, this is a teaching tradition that declares in Isaiah 58 verses 13 to 14 that if we turn from our own efforts and trust God to be in control of our lives, he will honor that trust with a prosperity and blessing which is beyond human ability to provide. Unfortunately, here again, human tradition gets caught up in the medium and through placing special importance on the seventh day of the week, misses the whole point of the exercise which is to learn a spiritual truth through a paradigm, through a pattern. So it should be understood that while man and his traditions consider fasting to be abstaining from food and in some more knowledgeable circles, sex and sleep also, or turn off the television, you can go that way too, God appears to have permitted this error to serve as a substitute for a deeper and more significant sacrifice. What is that? The sacrifice of denying one's own needs even to the point of going without in order to help another. For such is the will and character of God. There is a second type of fasting that may also be in line with God's intent. That's that of being preoccupied with God's will that you so preoccupied with God's will that you re disregard your own biological needs as you focus on the job at hand. That, that's, that's legitimate. That is legitimate. You know, I'm spending this time doing something the Lord wants me to do. 
And I know he wants me to do it because it's right in line with, right in line with his character. And I'm going to miss a meal or two out of this, but I don't care. Because I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it because it's right to do. But you don't miss a meal to get an agreement with God. You miss a meal because you are doing things that God wants you to do that just takes you past a meal. Right? That's a legitimate fast. But remember that whatever form fasting takes in your life, it must be in fulfillment of God's purpose, not your own, and must glorify or credit God. Anything less or anything else is vanity and can lead to pride. The church has a, sa has a few sacred cows, and fasting is one that most, well, a lot of people practice, and they defend it vigorously. People who fast defend fasting. Have you ever noticed? Vigorously, they defend it. I know full well that many will cry out, but I've done it and it works. But know that fasting also works for the pagan and the new ager. Works for them too. Does that make it right? My question is this. Is it better to measure truth by human experience or by God's word? Is, is it to be by pragmatism or by divine establishment? My purpose here, and let me tell you, they can say, well, God established it with the old covenant and a lot of people in the new covenant, including the, the Pharisees and everybody else, they practice it. God already established it. No, no, no. Jesus came along and said, wait a minute, that's not true anymore. That's the old. That was just a pattern of something that was real. That was a shadow that was cast by a reality. That's what it was. And it was fulfilled in Christ. And Christ told us what the difference is. And we have the choice. You can leave, believe him or not. You know? My purpose here is not to offend anybody, but to inform. As God says in Isaiah 1, verse 18, Come now, let us reason together. Do we really understand what God is trying to tell us? It's for his purpose alone that I do these things. So I hope that I have separated tradition from the truth. Remember in Mark 7, verse 9, Jesus told the religious leaders, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. They don't just reject it. They misinterpret it or reinterpret it. And I know I'm, go I'm going over time here, but this is an important subject. It really is. Um, there was a fellow, a young fellow in Australia uh, many, many years ago. I can't remember exactly. I think it was back in the 90s. Um, I, I heard an, uh, listened to an interview by him or with him. Um, he went to Australia and uh, went to the west, Western Australia, which is the west part. So it's the largest state in Australia and it's extremely desolate, extremely desolate. So he goes out there to Perth, which is the capital. It's one of the few, few towns in the, in the state. And he went out there with a, a girlfriend. And they uh, hired... I guess they rented some bicycles and they rode off into the wilderness and then uh, they, they got separated and uh, they got lost from each other. So uh, she hunted for him, couldn't find him. She got very worried about him, so she went back to civilization. And uh, they contacted her, his parents in, in the States and I guess they sent a, uh, or, or hired a team of people to try to find him. And so they spent a long time looking for him. Um, and uh, so they found him eventually. He was emaciated. He was almost, he was almost out of it. Uh, if, it if they'd been a little bit longer, he probably would have died. But they got him, and uh, he told them about how he, was, he did this deliberately. He wanted to go without food and without companionship 
in order to get closer to God. And that's why he did it. So he, he, he fasted from food and fasting from companionship. Uh, and he, he said how he's, he found a place where he's sitting on a ledge and he, he was really, really hungry. He was in very, very weak and everything. And uh, he's, he's speaking, trying to get to God, saying, God, uh, I, I, when am I going to hear from you? And he said, suddenly, I heard from God. And he said, you know what? You didn't need to do all this. <laughs> he said, you didn't need to do all this. All you need to do was listen to me and be good to people. <laughs> said, listen to me, read my word, apply it, put aside your own will for my will. That's all you ever needed to do. <laughs> so he ended, his, he ended his interview with this. He said, the interviewer said, would you do it again? And the response was, no. I found out that God was not much interested in us going without food. He would much rather we be kind and compassionate to each other. <laughs> yeah. And there's the words of Jesus. If you do this for the least, you've done it for me. And here it is. Matthew 25, verse 40. The king shall answer and say that to them, Verily I say to you, inasmuch as you have done it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. That's fasting. That is denial of self for the sake of another. Denial of self for Christ's sake. Amen? Amen.